Hello and welcome back to the podcast. It's Mark from Apprentice One to One, and I'm joined again by one of my usual hosts in Richard Harvey. And we've also got David Powell back again after his first appearance the other week on the podcast. And I'll start with you, David. How are you tonight? I'm um, good, thank you, Mark. Yeah, very good. To yourself? I'm really well, thanks. Keeping busy in the day job, and you've been very kind to come forward with an example for us to look at and work through later on in this podcast. And we're going to delve into a little bit more about who you are as well for the audience who follow along with Apprentice One to One, so we can hear a bit more of your backstory. But before we get into that, let's hear from Richard in San Francisco. How are you tonight, mate? <laughs> the weather's not too bad here, to be honest. Um, you know, kind of uh, enjoying it, get the last little bit of sunshine. Very well, thanks, mate. Very busy, as always. Lots going on. Um, but yeah, good, good, good to be back, good to be here. And uh, I'm glad that I'm not in the spotlight tonight. I haven't had to go away and produce something my fellow colleague uh dave's done it which is good so i'm looking forward to taking a bit of a back seat but yeah happy days great yeah i'm looking forward into seeing it as well but before we get on with all of that i've seen you two boys out on social media this last week or so you've been busy out at elex i saw you both feature heavily in mr savory's youtube drop this week uh it's nice to see you getting out front and center with electric safety first how did you find it down at elex in coventry Bad. Yeah, in, in one word, uh, and we did a bit of CPD, didn't we, Rich? On yeah, the first we did. Day. Um, yeah, yeah. And then the second day was more about a bit of networking, a bit of raising awareness. Um, you know, we we had our logos on the t shirts because a lot of the time people are looking at our ID badges and saying, Oh, electrical safety first, who are they? So it was more of a, a task to sort of get about and, and mingle with the crowd and sort of, uh, you know, raise the uh, awareness of who we are and what we do. Yeah, and, you know, Alex has been one of my highlights for many, many years, certainly many years ago when you used to go, and it was the electrician show, wasn't it? And, it, you know, it was all about asking those questions from the NIC or whoever it was at the time that, you, you know, you couldn't ask when you was being assessed on site or you weren't really sure. And back then there wasn't as many webinars and, you know, um podcasts and youtube bits and pieces like there is now but you know i've enjoyed it over the years still enjoy it bumped into a couple of old uh pals that i worked with many years ago you know 30 odd years ago just as i was starting my apprenticeship and even in my mid-20s a couple of lads i've not seen for a while um that was really good nice to as dave said get involved with a bit of cpd that was pretty good there was an interesting one from the jrb talking about raising standards which was good, um, and the different cards that are available now, which weren't available then. So for full-time learners as well, experienced workers, it's nice to see a wider range of cards, which was pretty good. IET as always, um, had some interesting um, CPD on. NAPIT had their normal observation coding, enjoyed that one. Caught up with Paul Chaffers from Hager, um, got a couple of new products available on their three-phase boards. That was quite interesting having a look at that. But there was a few key players missing, um, you know, the likes of Hager, not Hager, my one about Weira and Weir and uh, Armeg and a few others. Um, quite a few manufacturers missing as well, no one from Electrium uh, and a few others. But generally, it was well worthwhile. We had a good couple of days, didn't we, Dave? And yeah. those for uh, us go really quick. And I said this time we need at least two days. So the first day we can get all our CPD get all that in as well, because that's important. Kind of scout around the first day, and then the second day then we can, you know, go and do a bit of probing and try and meet up with a few people, uh, have a chat, and just see what the general feel is, because when you, you're not out on site as much uh, as you used to be, it's nice to still be, you know, at the forefront of it and and find out from you guys that are still grafting and putting it in, what the, the problems, you know, your day-to-day -day problems that you face. Um, so, yeah, it was good. And hopefully moving forward, that good news, Mark, about apprentices and learners can can attend the events. I think they missed a trick there many years ago, but that's good news. Uh, and I think they'll find it really beneficial as well. You know, I think it's good. It's a good thing. So, yeah, I mean, I was I put my my uh, stake in the sander for that one a while ago that yeah. I wouldn't be going while that rule was in cha in place. But I'm going to Exeter now. I've been speaking to some people from good. Alex about that, so I'm looking forward yeah. to attending. That's actually next week. So I'm going to jump down. It's the furthest one away from me I could go yeah. to, but I've been made such a fuss about that rule. 
it felt like the right thing to do. So I'm going to go along and see if a few people from Apprentice One to One will join me down there as well. Um, and yeah, like you say, it's all about meeting people, isn't it? I really yeah, love yeah. the the CEF um, live event. And I think that's set a, an unrealistic high bar for every other event that takes place because yeah, obviously they've got a huge budget for that. Yeah. But it, I mean, is, it is an opportunity to network, isn't it? And certainly for learners that are looking for an apprenticeship and things like that, that's, that's the place to go. You know, bump in face to face with some of the contractors and all that. But don't be afraid then to talk to some of the technical guys that represent, you know, the, the competent person schemes and people like myself, Dave, yourself. Hopefully you get recognised. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'd like to think that most sparks are there to try and help and support each other. And that's what it's all about. But no, I've I, seen I, you guys, you guys have been making your own content as well. I've seen on LinkedIn, you've had a few sit down chats. Were they done at Elex? Yeah. Yeah. We pretty much just got the, got the gimbal out. We didn't, we didn't sort of re-rehearse anything as you could probably, you could probably <laughs> gather. They we were just, good. We, we just good. hit the record button. Yeah. Um, but we've, we have been working on something in the background, haven't we, Rich, with regards yeah. to uh, GS38. Um, we've edited that this week. But we're pretty happy with that. So shortly that will be released. And that's going to be beneficial to, to everyone, not just apprentices, but to, to everyone in industry. But it's something that if I was still in the teaching space, I would, I would have found it really useful. Um, so we, 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 you know, we're viewing everything from all angles because we've we've been in those different positions, industry, teaching, and now what we do now. So a, a real advantage. Real advantage. It's brilliant to see um, an organisation and you guys in particular putting that forward, such as Electric Safety First. It's fantastic. So keep going with that. I mean, I, I know on the journey I've been on, putting content out there can be very daunting, but it must be even more pressured when you are representing an organization in the way you guys do so it, it carries a heavy weight but don't be put off just bend through it and i'm sure it'll be high quality brilliant content and i'll definitely share it as far and wide as i possibly can do thanks yeah. mark well, I, I think we'll get there when we're ready we're just I, giving it a go yeah we're and i think go. we know we know it's not put we know it's not sort of polished or anything yet but i think that's part of the i think it needs to be a little bit organic a little bit raw i think if it's over rehearsed um it doesn't you, you can sort of tell so we you know we we tend to sort of bounce off each other and um i think it, it'll develop over time it'll get better it will but at the end of the day what we're trying to you know point out is that you know we we started many many years ago went on the same journey that a lot of learners are going on our apprentices now we've all done apprenticeships and we've gone through that you know that three, four, five year process. And then we've spent time in industry. We've gone back into teaching. And now we're in, in the position where we're at now where hopefully we, you know, we're on, we've got a platform where we can have more of an influence. And we know there's problems with competency, training, you know, understanding, but we're in a position, no good moaning about something. What are we doing to try and help? And you know, we're able to do that luckily, um, it's, through level safety first as as well. So to be able to you know, fill those gaps with a bit of luck. And, you know, we're ordinary people, you know, and you're welcome to come and have a chat whenever and and uh, through yourselves, you know, one-to-one, we can help in that way. We're going to be launching um, some podcasts ourselves. So the role is going to be reversed. So you're going to be <laughs> <laughs> invited, um, you know, to come and have a chat with us, uh, Industry Insights hashtag in it, Dave. So we're going to yeah. have a chat, look at things that you might not look at. You know, we had a good chat with Kevin Sparrow, Obviously, yeah. from AAR. Lovely guy is Kevin. He's been on the podcast yes. before. Yeah. Top guy. Top man. But, you know, I had dealings with Kevin, me and, me and Gaz, many years ago, eight, nine years ago, when EAL first launched uh, their domestic um, installer-type qualification, which was a two-year qual. Uh, and, that you know, there was so much you had to do in that qual. The logbook for it and everything was immense. And this was eight, nine years ago. So kind of known Kevin for quite a, quite a while, but never actually met him face to face. And um, it was a great opportunity. We had a chat with him and we're definitely going to go and see him, do a little bit of a podcast as well, digging a bit deeper into these qualifications because, you know, even I've looked at a qualification manual, whether it be sitting girls, yeah, yeah, whoever, and thought, how the hell did they put that assessment together? You know, what was the thought process behind it? It's got conduit, it's got trunking, blah, blah, blah. But why has it got this or why has it got that? So it'd be nice to dig a little bit deeper and find out who they, they're answerable to at the end of the day and, you know, what kind of inspires him to 
keep producing these new quals and what what goes into the background of it. So interesting stuff. But yeah, you know, it's exciting. I'm times. sure. I'm sure you guys will put forward a great podcast, and I'll enjoy listening. I'm on far too many of the podcasts myself, and I can't <laughs> stand my own voice. So it's going to be something for me to listen to in the van traveling around. I think that's the way a lot of people take content in yes. these days, isn't it? So if yeah. you can get yeah. messaging out there around how these standards are developed or yeah. whatever else topics you're going to cover is absolutely brilliant. So just go yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, and as, as we've just said there, you guys are keen and passionate in industry. I think it's important to keep emphasizing that. It's something I do on the podcast and my content a lot. There's loads of people like you out trying to drive industry forward. And I can think of Darren Cranis at the ECA. There's Craig O'Neill now going into the IET. There's Mark Curls. We've got Michael Peace. There's all these people, just to name drop one or two, they, you know, there's lots more are in and around all of that. And I think it's important we remember that when we're complaining about the state of industry and things to have a bit of context to it. But there's lots and lots of positive energy out there as well. And you two are a big part of that now. And I'm really pleased you're coming on the Apprentice One to One podcast to share a little bit here and there as well. And before yeah. we delve into David's example that he's brought forward tonight, we're going to have a little bit of a chat about your past, if you don't mind, David. Yeah. So we'll start start as far back as you want to go, or as far back as you can remember. What first brought you into the electrical industry? Yeah, um, I, I left school, didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, jealous of my friends that wanted to do certain things, and I was thinking, what? Why am I the only person who doesn't know what I wanted to do? Um, and basically, cut, cut a long story short, my mum, bless her, found the job in the local newspaper, and it was for the Midlands Electricity Board. And I applied for it, went through a load of psychometric tests, practical assessments, interviews, and basically the Electricity Board used to take on two apprentices from each area per year. And I was based at the Warsaw uh, depot on Green Lane. And that's where I started my sort of journey in the electrical industry, which was in, as I said, on the last podcast I was on in uh, 1999. So been in the game uh, a, a fair while now. So did my apprenticeship with the MEB. Then I moved on into working at uh, hotels and uh, travel lodges, obviously doing the installs there. So it was either refurb or new installs. And then I sort of got fed up with working away. I was I was a young lad at the time, but I, I did, I'm a bit of a home boy. I like being at home pretty much, as it says on the tin. Um, so then I started work at another company, a local team. We did a lot of new build stuff. So... Crest Homes, David Wilson Homes, new build sites, massive. Um, worked there for a while. And then my, my sort of thing with work, I sort of do something for a bit. And then once I feel like I've mastered it or got to a certain level, I, I tend to move on. Um, so we did the new builds for a bit. Then I went subcontracting and did more commercial stuff. So... Uh, we did a lot of work at Wolverhampton University, Solihull University, um, and then schools as well, and and some more new builds. Shortly after that, worked at a company 10 minutes from my house. Uh, employer was really, really keen to sort of upskill my current sort of skill set. So I started taking on more sort of responsibility, inspection and testing, um, using certification software for the uh, certificates. I did my 2391 um, in 2007, I think, 2006, 2007. That was the easy, yeah, that was. Anything after 2005 was easy. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> it was a Not to diminish your achievement. It, it was a, a three-hour <laughs> written exam with the practical when That's I right, did it. So it was pretty, pretty tough. Um yeah. And yeah, at that point, I became QS for the, for that company, um, which I was very proud of. I was probably how old was I then? Twenty twenty three. Um, so I was I was pretty chuffed with that. Um, and at that company as well, we used to do sort of one of a kind uh, installations. So you know, some of the properties we were worked in were sort of a couple of million pounds. So we we used to work on intelligent lighting panels, eye light. Um, so you could program it, um, you know, it's cat five to the switches and, and things like that. So that was that was that was pretty good with the 
sort of intelligent controls just sort of coming out. We used to do a lot of fire and flood call outs um, for sort of insurance purposes. So I used to go and see some sort of terrible um, sites really where someone's had a fire in the property and obviously it's not, not nice and I used to just make sure everything was safe, uh, put temporary supplies in if I could. Uh, and things like that. So that was that that was that was rewarding. And then uh, shortly after, I set my own business up. Um, NIC registered, uh, had my own apprentice, and sort of really enjoyed sort of teaching him and bringing him through. And he he won Apprentice of the Year at Burton College. Sweet, um, awesome. <laughs> he, he he's he just fantastic. I used to. I was that sad. I used to test test him on Mac ZS values in the van, driving home and stuff like that. So, oh, <laughs> yeah. Kind of days, that is. yeah, I know. I think that's probably why he don't. He, you know, he worked. He, he worked for me, and then I'd sort of I, I'd had enough after about three and a half years, and I started working for a, a company in Burton on Trent, which is probably the best experience I've had in industry, uh, um, back in electrical services, and. My apprentice went to Australia for a year because he's a very good cricketer and he went out to do that. And then when he come back, I got him a job at, at the place in Burton. So we were sort of reunited sort of thing. So that was nice. And <clears throat> at the back in electrical services was the last company I worked for before I went into teaching, which I'll come to in a minute. But there I spent five years and I, I did agricultural installations renewable installations, so solar farms, wind turbines, combined heating and power systems, the so CHP systems. Um, the PV systems we did were up to one megawatt, so some real... Juicy stuff. Juicy stuff, yeah, big stuff. Um, really interesting work. More sort of, a lot of it was sort of um, mechanical as well as electrical. Um, oh, yeah, a couple of things I forgot to mention. I don't know how long we got on this podcast. Um, I've done hazardous it. area work as well, which was the company that was that was local to me, GM Crazy Electrical. So George, if you're watching, thank you. Um, and, and that was the person who was who encouraged me to do more and more. So I did my design qualification as well uh, while I was there. This was pre the, the Burton Company, and we did. And that's that, while we're on design area. day. Is that that design qual then? That was a bolt on, wasn't it? Because you you did something different to what I did. Because I did the C certificate, but yours was called something else, wasn't it? Yeah, so I did the 2391 at Burslem College, which is Stoke College, which was really good um, in 2006, 2007. And then when I completed that, I I did the 2400, um, which was electrical design and verification. But th at that point, it was level three, but right. you were assessed in the same way that you are now on the level four qualifications, the 2396. So... You had a written exam and a, and a project to do, and the project I've actually still got. It's underneath my my desk here. Uh, really enjoyed doing that, but the the exam was was tough as it should be. Um, but again, I was encouraged to do that by by my employer, and then we started doing design work for National Grid in the Hasdis area installations, and it was all on gas sites within the Midlands. So we used to do the designs for them, and then we'd go in and and do the refurbs in the non-hazardous area, so in lot the storerooms, and in the hazardous area, we've lot the gas mains coming through. So that was really interesting work. Um, but yeah, going back to Batkins, that's where I sort of flourished and gained a, a hell of a load of uh, experience. Worked all over the country, doing all these PV systems, free range poultry units, so uh, chicken sheds, turkey sheds, uh, you know, Huge sites, uh, some of them, especially the turkey farms. <coughs> Excuse me. So was this the original? Was this the original solar boom? Then is this sort of two thousand? Yeah, so, so sort of twenty twelve. I started at yeah. Batman School, and it was it was massive. We were doing. I mean, we had at one point we had four teams, and we were, <coughs> we were doing um, about four systems a week. Um, we were. Uh, yes, Electrical in Derby's biggest um, customer at the time, the amount of PV cable we were buying and everything. <laughs> so, but no, it's it, it really, really good. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've had a right varied 
you know, lead up to going into training. I think that's where you're taking to as, as on your next step in your career. But you know, what a, what a foundation you've got coming all the way from sort of the electricity board through through every, pretty much every sector, running your own business, training yeah. an apprentice, and working in solar PV. You're like a decade ahead of, ahead of everyone else with all that experience. I've um, I, f- I forgot to mention the airport as well. I worked at Birmingham Airport for a short stint doing maintenance, but wasn't really wasn't really for me. It was a bit too sort of slow paced we there's there's a you know to do one job that would normally take you a couple of hours it took all day because of security which it do, it does need but i just found it a little bit you know a little bit, little bit slow yeah <laughs> so yeah i've pretty much done you know domestic commercial industrial has this area design maintenance inspection and testing um my biggest sort of passions are, are testing uh, design uh, and doing things right, you know, doing them once, doing them right. I've always been um, an advocate of taking a bit more time to do things and, um, you know, make sure things are right rather than just chuck it in. I'd rather, you know, if someone was working for me, I'd rather them take an, another few hours to get something done right and, you know, eat into the profit a little bit then just chuck it in and have to go back in a couple of weeks' time because something's not quite right. So, um, But I think that, that stems from the person who sort of taught me right at the beginning, a guy called Steve Hartshorn. Um, he always used to say, just, you know, take your time and do it and do a nice, neat job. So I was like, take pride in, in everything that I've done. Take back. The amount of pictures I've got is unbelievable, you know, of installations. I've um, never seen any of them. <laughs> I was going to say you look. You saw about hundred of them, you were right? <laughs> well, you know, when you when you when you're trying to put something in your mind about a certain installation or what would you do in this case, or etc. etc. You can't beat having those photographs and images yeah. of, of installations yeah. or you know certain types of equipment. That oh, well, I see what you mean. I can see how you did that. Or yeah, yeah. that makes sense. So vitally important. Very good. I mean, Since the invention might... of smartphones, I think there's yeah. a picture of every bit of equipment I've worked on before I've started working on it and yeah. afterwards because this yeah, picture speaks a thousand cool. words, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. What have you done today? This two yeah. pictures before and after. Yep. Yeah. So I you can see it's... what you've done wrong and put in the wrong place. That's, yeah. that's my case. <laughs> I mean, I've got pictures um, when the first camera phone that I had the Sony Ericsson with the plug in camera underneath. And I've got pictures of that, but it's sort of the, it's like a thumbnail image. It's really yeah. small because obviously the quality is bad. But I've always sort, I've got pic- pictures of all all different parts of of my sort of career. But one one thing I will say to the people that are going to watch this is, your apprenticeship and your career is all about making mistakes. Um, you, you're not going to go through your career without making mistakes. That that's what your apprenticeship is all about. So. I used to beat myself up a bit, um, a bit too much actually, uh, and be very sort of self-critical. And the older I've got, I realised I didn't need to do that because it was all about the learning process. And at some point, everyone cocks up, everyone makes a mistake. Even even the seasoned veterans will, will make a mistake because you get complacent. So, yeah, for, for those that are in it now, you might be first year, second year, third year apprentice, if you feel like you know you're having a bit of a tough time and you're making a few mistakes, just don't worry because you'll get there. You'll get there in the end. But you'll still make mistakes 10, 20 years down the line. But that's something that you 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 sort of pick up with time. So just you know, don't do what I did and be be harsh on yourself because it'll affect might affect your progress. I think a lot of us are like that. To be honest, I was the same. In fairness, it's kind of with age. I've- relaxed a bit more on that and accepted yeah. that human error and making mistakes is just yeah. a life skill sometimes isn't it it happens to yeah. everybody and it is an important it's, message to share it's a good point to raise david that one it is hard though as well when you when you you know you're looking to get perfection but it's not always possible it, it is difficult yeah. i look at things and you know even the simple things even painting and decorating for instance and you think oh i'm not a painter but i still want it to be as 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 good as it can and then you think oh no i'll do it again i'll do it again mm-hmm. but at some point you know, you've got to accept that it's you do your best, and that's what you got to understand. So you you might just say that's just life, but it's how yeah. you how you get around them and owning up to them and saying, you know what, 
I didn't quite do that correctly. I need yeah. to do it this way. And that's where you learn, isn't it? That's part of life and that's learning. I think mm-hmm. that's a key thing as well, Rich. It, yeah. it, it's being honest as well and mm-hmm. saying to whoever you're working with, oh, I've, I've messed up here yeah? because yeah. they'll appreciate you telling them then finding out later on when they're testing and it's too late. hundred percent. It's too late <laughs> to replace that cable because it's all been plastered yeah. over and things. So just just be honest with people and they'll appreciate your honesty and, and just think about, you know, what you did wrong and then try and move forward next time. And so that that's what it's about. You know, don't put too much pressure. Nothing's ever perfect. Like Rick said, you can't. If you're searching for per- 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 if you're searching for perfection, you'll never find it. Unfortunately, it'll be no, something you'll... will be excellent and, and outstanding, but it won't ever be per- perfect. So, it's yeah, it's yeah, finding it's... that you know common ground. I think in it with yourself to accept your capabilities and what you want to produce in, in work, but also to acknowledge that you know sometimes you're going to drop the ball and not quite reach that. And the, the perfection bar is a really, really high one that no one is ever really going to get to. So it's a lot of pressure to keep shooting for that every time you go to work. Yeah. I used to I used to do that a lot. I'd want everything to be absolutely perfect yeah. and, you know, bang on the money. But it's not realistic. You do your best in the time you've got to do a task um, to give good value to your customers at the end of the day. Exactly. I think that's the, that's the important balance to strike. It's not easy. But sometimes it can really affect your, your mental health and well-being by thinking you're not good yeah. enough when really yeah. you are. So it's uh, yeah. an important message to raise that one, David. I, I really like that. Yeah. Um, did you guys work together then in training when your careers moved along? I kind of get in the vibe yeah. that you've got a bit of a history be pre where I'll you go, are now. Uh, I'll go part two then now. So that was my <laughs> that was my sort of career in industry. And I, I used to enjoy um, sort of not teaching people on site, but sort of if there was something that I could show someone or explain to someone how something works or if if we were doing some testing and you know I had someone with me and they wanted to know a little bit more about why we were doing it not how to do it because they all know how to do it if they wanted to know why and you know what we were comparing results to I used to really enjoy that aspect of it and I thought you know what I quite fancy doing this as, as a as a job so a role come up um, at a training provider, um, and I, I went for it. Uh, it was quite. A, it was a bit of a wrench actually, because I was sort of, I I'd really sort of found my feet at, at back in electrical uh, in Burton, but I sort of felt I'd gone as as high as I could. Um, so I wanted a bit of a challenge, um, and it certainly was challenging. So yeah, I met Richard at the training provider. Uh, we worked together. I think I did about eight months before I'd sort of had enough. Um, and then I went to a local college, and uh, I was there for five years. So I worked for South Staffordshire College, and um, I worked out of Cannock Campus, running the electrical department there, teaching apprentices, adult learners, and and full time learners. And there was a period of time I absolutely loved it. I did my uh, teaching degree, my sir Ed. So I, I pushed myself. I never, I never thought um, I'd do anything at sort of uni to speak and get to that level. But I, I think you just got to sort of believe in yourself and and keep pushing. So yeah. again, the guys that are doing the apprenticeship now, once, once you've done your apprenticeship, get you get settled and then think what what could I do next and and just keep going, keep going as far as you can. If you don't want it, that's fine, you know. But for those, the the sky's the limit. I don't, you, I don't think I'd be where I am now, to be honest. But you, you know. built that apprenticeship provision from scratch, though, didn't you, Dave, at that college? Because it was yeah, just the building, wasn't it? Yeah, they closed the campus previously, and then they, they were reopening the campus at Canick, and they said, would I want to sort of run it, so to speak? And the first year I had a level one group, full-timers, level two, uh, I did the 18th edition on an evening for the adult learners, which was great. I used to used to love teaching the adult learners. Um, one of them I saw at the ECA roadshow today, actually. Okay, good. And, um, <laughs> and then um, I had a first year apprentice group, and then each year, obviously, the second year we had we had two apprentice groups and more more learners, and we had a level three group, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, by the time I left. Um, I, I left to join 
uh, ESF in January this year. We had over a hundred apprentices on the wow. Bus. So, so you've put a shift in there, building it up from scratch to that again. That's yeah. some effort, mate. Fair play. Yeah. We had one workshop, which eventually turned to two, um, and it was it was what was good is I had one one particular group that I took through from year one all the way through. Um, no one else had any involvement with them, and um, they, they all got through and everything. So that was that was such a rewarding job, a rewarding role, and challenging. Probably the most challenging job I've I've had. Um, but it sort of it balanced out. But again, felt like I'd gone as far as got as far as I could with that, um, amongst other things. And then I just wanted to do the do the next thing, as you yeah. can probably gather from my sort of industry experience. I've gone so far, and then thought, well, what can I, what can I do now? You know, I didn't want to. You're be in a good same a good place, place with, now, where you are yeah, at the ESR. Yeah, yeah. Well, it it's something that. People, I think I'm lying about this, but when I was in industry, it was known as Electrical Safety Council, and I yep. used to use their um, guides back then. Um, so to be on that team now, producing the guides, editing the guides with Richard, is like a bit of a dream come true for me, to be honest. It's because... great to see them taking in people like yourself to these organisations, because you've got such a foundation in industry similar to Richard's story in the past you've both got this vast experience and you've been through the apprenticeship you've been in industry you've been in training you've seen every aspect of what's going on out there and to now have your input at that level I think that's wonderful I think that's really powerful for industry and it's great for you guys as well to get into those places and see behind the scenes of what goes on and help impact and change things so you must be um, finding that rewarding since January and Richard even more recently I think yeah, from April. Yeah, it's just it's yeah. it's just nice to work with Dave again. You know, we'd had a couple of we'd never not lost contact over the years. We've always kept in contact and you know shared um, material and bits and pieces. And you know, new regs come out, we'd have a conversation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I didn't we've think got the same outlook, haven't we? I yeah, think we've got the same. We've got yeah. the same passion for the industry, and yeah. we, we we've always got on. Yeah, and it just the we've just basically picked up from where we, you know, we haven't worked together for five years. Yeah. But, you know, we're, we're like an old couple when you stick in the room <laughs> together. Um, but I think it's that thing. It's that shared passion. It's like you say, the, the, the other people um, in industry, the other organizations, everyone wants the same thing. And it, we're trying to raise standards and raise awareness and, you know, raise the bar with safety and, we all want the same thing. We, we all want to go in the same direction. It's just how how we get there. So, right. well, you know, but, we're going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until there's no... It does seem left. to be moving in, in the right directions more than it used to, I would say. The last couple of years, I think we've seen a, a fair few positive changes, I would say, just as an outside observer, as a normal everyday electrician and business owner. It certainly feels like that. But there's a bit more joined up thinking between some of these organizations we might consider as the driving forces behind industry like the nic the eca NAPIT, the iet there seems to be a bit of that going on which can only be a good thing in my opinion yeah and more more of these stories need to be told so and we can do that via podcasts and videos and things that we're planning on doing but i think people need to understand that you know the regs is not written by the iet because people think it is <laughs> you know it's it's a number of organizations that come together you know, based on international and European standards and and apply them the best way that they can. And, you know, the same as with our guides and everything else, it's not something that's done overnight. You know, it's it's contribution from all the organisations and we have to take everyone's comments yeah. into account and then we try and produce. And again, it's when we're talking about perfection, you're trying to get it the best it can, but you're never going to get no. everybody agreeing on one thing, you know, and... Yeah. Um, and you know that's that's where we've got to tell the story about how that kind of comes together and what the story is behind that and how they you know first got introduced all them years ago and what we're planning on doing with them moving forwards similar to rag as well that dave chairs those meetings those are brilliant to me it's like the best brains in industry are coming together um to kind of find solutions to you know, problems on site or misinterpretation of the regs where it's not 100% clear. 
And um, it's great, you know, we've got EICR working groups, again, trying to improve EICRs in terms of, you know, what the recipient can expect, but also what the inspector should be doing, et cetera. We've got a, a brand new guide that's coming out very shortly on that. Um, so it'd be nice to tell the story behind all the stuff that we're doing, but at least we're at that level now where we can have a better understanding of the process of, you know, you've got the ever evolving brown book or red book or orange book, whatever it will be next, because, you know, been in teaching me and Dave had for a number of years and everybody that comes to do the regs is, Oh, I've got to pay another 80 quid for a book, another course I've got to do. They're just trying to make money out of us and all the rest of it. And so we've seen all of it, but if we can explain, because we've been involved with it all in simple terms, why something has been introduced and the reasons for it, I think people will accept it more. And it's only from people like yourself as well, Mark, and other people that the industry is improving, I think, because of awareness and support and everything else. And, you know, there's still a way to go, yeah. but it's no good moaning about it. What we're going to do to to improve it or make things better. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great industry to be in. I've had a fantastic career, not ready to retire just yet. But, no, I don't, I don't hang up the screwdrivers and uh, the, the laptop <laughs> just yet. But you, you're yeah. right, you've got you've got the rag where these things can be submitted in terms yeah. of regs and every other guidance document that is produced and published by the IET and BSI, however that works. Yeah. There's the draft for public comments. We can all yeah. have an input. And yeah. most of the people feeding into these subcommittees around JPL 64, I think largely volunteers. It's just yeah. people coming together, giving their views and debating and pushing these things to try and meet it out in a way that that represents industry in the best way, I guess, whilst aligning with those international and European standards that you mentioned, Richard. So it is, it is difficult. I think something that would help kind of blow that open for electricians to see and visualise and understand would be more openness around some of those JPL meetings. I do realise with, with BS0, they're not allowed to do that. It has to be private and such. But if the minutes of one of those meetings could be published or even the attendees just to show what goes down at that level, I think that would reassure a lot of electricians that it's not the way we think it is because i've yeah. had those thoughts that you've you guys just mentioned then about yeah. paying for the courses buying the regs book it's a natural huh. chain of thought when you're the one paying those bills and taking time out to go and do the training and you don't fully see what's gone into it so i think that is something that could be explained more clearly yeah. and transparently i guess is the right word yeah i think uh, i think you're right there mark because if 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 the people in the industry could see that side of things they'd probably appreciate um you know what what goes into you know changes to regulations curry and, right. and everything else but because we don't see that and you know i i didn't really see what went into it and what even what went into our best practice guys until i started um and then you don't sort of truly appreciate it's like our guides have got our badge on the front, but if, if people look on page two and they'll see all the other major uh, organisations and industry that contribute to it, it's not um, it's not straightforward task and it takes time. So when guides are updated, it, it that that's probably gone through three months of comments, uh, and that's an existing one. Never mind a new a new guide. So right. yeah, but ultimately, as you know, as a a, a free to download so um but other ones that we have to pay for we we do because the work that, that goes into those is is phenomenal it's on another scale it's on another level so yeah as an electrician i think that the two best bits of content if you like our guides that i've ever taken in have been the nic pocket guides and the best practice guides yeah. and again both really available if you was a member of the NIC and obviously the best practice guys is free to anybody. And I will drop a link alongside this podcast for anyone who wants to go and download those. You can do. I think they're absolutely fantastic. And it's a great way of breaking down the intent of the regulations into something that electricians might read on their dinner breaks or after work yeah. one night. And it's going to get that message over to them more clearly than sitting reading through a regs book, because that is a, a beast of a book to get through, isn't it? Let's it be is. honest. It is, but I think the longer that you're in industry, the easy. Well, it doesn't get easy, but the easier it gets. I mean, I, I did my 16th edition. I think it was 2005, and then I've obviously done my 17th and 18th. And each time, you you just get more used to the the terminology used, how the how it's all sort of put together. Because obviously, it's written in a certain in a certain language. I call it reg speak. 
Um, <laughs> but you do. I think. I think you just the longer you're, you're in it, you you get used to it, and you sort of, you know, you pick up little nuances and little things uh, along the way. Um, definitely, yeah. definitely do. You definitely do. And I think now we're kind of moving along in the podcast. We should touch on the design question that you've yeah. been working away on in the background, David, because no problem. we've got another example. There's been people kind of messaging in around the other podcasts we've already done on this. There was some great feedback on the last one you two guys were involved with. And we've had a few requests. And ironically, one of those requests is very much pitched at the scenario you've put together, David, and it leans into your experience in the solar and agricultural I industry, I believe. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Yeah. So we are... Uh, me and Richard had a little discussion after the last podcast and um, I'm sort of bringing something a little bit different to the table. So it might be challenging for some. It, it might be, well, I don't know, because obviously when we're, in, when we're teaching, we know our, we know our audience, we know the, the strengths, the weaknesses, and we know people that might find it too easy. So it might have to be tweaked slightly. Whereas this, I don't really know. The, the the audience as such because you've got a wide range of people tuning in such so a wide range at all sorts of levels i've tried to sort of make create something that might be it might be challenging enough or it, it could well we'll just have to see we'll have yeah. to see but I can the audience will there. decide i'm sure it'll be it bang on yeah. perfect but this is going to be using different parts of your brain that we might not have used in the previous ones. Cause you're going to follow the same process, isn't we Dave, that we followed yeah. in the, in the previous example. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. You'll see little, little curve balls in there that yeah. you might you'll not see, have. You'll see the layouts very similar to, to Richard's question. So I'm, I'm asking you similar things to do. Ultimately it's obviously a cable calculation with some additional considerations to make, but in the last podcast I was on, I was saying to people, you know, tread tread carefully and mm. and don't don't sort of jump in because you might miss something. And I, I'll advise everyone again on this one. There's a few things in there that that and it could t- could take you down the wrong the wrong route. So just take time with it, have a bit of fun with it, um, and and then obviously in, the, in on the next podcast I can run through and and see where where we've got. But just don't forget as well the last one. I, I attempted to do it the same night that Richard was presenting it. I made a mistake, so just don't worry about it. <laughs> it's easy <laughs> done. Easily yeah. done. Don't worry about easy it. Done. Easy done. Are you okay. going to share your screen and run through the yeah. example, or are we um, just yeah, going to pitch it out there to the internet? Are we going to do this? Um, I'll share it there. Yeah. Okay. So. Ah, see that? Nice. Here we go. Okay. So I'll just run through this scenario then. Um, obviously, I spoke about working on PV systems. So, oh, lo and behold, I've got a PV, <laughs> a PV system for you. So, your scenario on this one is uh, Farmer Brown has been granted permission to add to her existing groundmate solar PV system. So, she's got a 50 kilowatt three phase system and she's looking to have an additional 50 kilowatt system in the same field. Now, in this particular question, we're not we're not worried about the DC side of things, okay? So, I've just put images of the panels and everything just to bring it to bring this question to life. You know, and it's to... something we can explore in a, in a future podcast. Anyway, yeah, the DC yeah. side of things and other considerations. Yeah, yeah. So, in the company I used to work for, we used to have a string design created by the company who we were doing the installs for, and then we used to design the AC side. So. We'd have a plan. It'd say, you know, ten strings of of twenty, and then we could we we just arrange them however we wanted and tie wrap it all and then run it back to the inverter. So we we didn't get involved with the DC side. So this is just AC. So don't. It worry. makes sense to start at that level anyway, and we'll build as Richard yeah. said, DC in yeah. for the future. Yeah. <laughs> so a little scenario there. So we're, we're having a, some more PV put in. Because she's happy with the performance of the system, so similar to this, a grandma, grandma array. Okie dokie. So, two new circuits are to be installed to feed two new solar PV inverters, of which will be mounted on the array via the structure shown below. So, her existing system, so underneath the panels, 
She's got two inverters which come to this 50 kilowatt um, PV system. So basically, we're, we're doing the same again. The one caveat to this is that we're feeding the two new inverters off this existing supply. So there's a TPNM board in this enclosure, and we're going to be looking to run it from there. So what the viewers are going to have to consider is we've got um, a cumulative vault drop in this particular question. So we're not... Nice. That'll present a new it. challenge. We're yeah. not designing it from the origin. We, we've got to consider this isn't the origin, but this is where we're feeding it from. Okay. So similar arrangement um, to what we've got uh, in the image. I'll just scroll down. <clears throat> So a little bit more detail. So the earthing system is TT. So obviously we've had PME before, so we get, we're going on a different earthing arrangement. It's supplied via a low uh, public low voltage distribution system. Um, I'm going to invite Rich in now. Why why is that? Why have I made a point of saying that, Rich? Or have you covered this before? No. So they might need to consider where the supply comes from when you're looking at table 4AB in terms of your maximum percentage of volt drop, but I'm not going to give them too much information. But anything yeah. that's in the question is generally in the question because it's important. Yeah. So whether it be a Dave question, a my question, a City and Guild's question, an EAL question, generally the information that's in the question is there because it's important. So there's always you've always got to read the question, read it again, and I used to just highlight the key points in that question because it, if it's there, it's there for a reason. Not always, but generally. So public low voltage distribution may be important when you're, when you're looking at table 4 AB. I'm yeah. highlighting it as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly what Rick said. Look look at the wording. If something jumps out of you, uh, jumps out of you rather highlight a pen, I'd suggest the same yeah. as what Rick would. And if, if you know... Highlight the key points. Yeah, if you're not, if you can't remember what a, a TT earthing system is, you can always go back, have a look in your on-site guide, etc., or yeah. um, part three of the regs. You know, there might, be a, there might be a reason for that as well. So that's something that you're going to have to have a look at in your regs book. There might be a reason why it's TT. Okay, um, we've got 400 volt three phase supply. So there's a there's an image here of um a, of a installation, um. RA, we've got 33 ohms. So rather than ZE that we'd have on a TN system, we're looking at RA, which is the earth electrode resistance. So you're probably thinking, have I missed a decimal point out? Uh, <laughs> I haven't. Yeah. Um, I'll just give you a, a value. For... It's a good value. Yeah, yeah. It, is. it is. There might be more than one rod in there, though. So, <laughs> yeah. so we Don't used think... to use... We used to, if obviously we used to work on these systems all the time. So, depending on the resistivity of the of the soil, you know, if it was rocky or or you know made up of clay, um, we used to have to use the um, earth electrodes with the thread on, and we'd just couple another one on, and we'd just drive it down further, or we'd put a earth nest in to get a decent value. Um, uh, one thing I will say on this image. There's a little clue, um, which you'll sort of some of you might pick pick up on when you get to one of the questions towards the end, and some of you might not. So there's a clue in the image itself, which I've not stated what it is on this left hand side, but have a little look at that image if you're stuck on a particular question and it might point in the right direction. Okay, and just. If you're unsure about some of the terminology in the question or indeed an abbreviation or a symbol, don't forget in part two of the regs book, exactly. so your definitions of your terminology. If you don't know what RA means, you can look in part two again. It'll tell you what, what, that, what that means or abbreviation, yeah. etc. Don't ever be afraid to go back to part two. Yeah, the book use the book. For. That's what it's for. That's yeah, if you've, got, if you've got a regs book, it should have the front cover hanging off. It should have... You know, notes in it, highlighted, use it. That's what, don't just buy it for, you know, people when they have their inspections. Use it, sir. Yeah. So yeah, a little clue in the little clue, clue, uh, clue in the image. I don't know what's up with me tonight. I'm tipping over my words. 
Okay. Um, other information. There are some spare ways capacity available in the existing six-way 250 amp TP and N board. So three phase and neutral. If those are not familiar with that terminology, it's just what we what we say in industry. So um, that's on the existing array. So we just go back up to that image. This is the existing board. There's some spare ways available so you can feed your two new circuits, okay? It does tell us there, and I've highlighted this because it's important, the three-phase volt drop at this dB, which we call PV dB1, photovoltaic dB1, is 6 volts. So that's important, okay? Oh, she'll say no more about that. <laughs> Right, the circuits are to be wired using Dr Draker or Draker, however you want to say, tomato, tomato. Four core steel wire armored 90 degree thermosetting insulated cable with copper conductors. And what I've done is I've sent Mark the um I've sent Mark the PDF of this and the data sheets embedded in the PDF. So you'll be able to click on this and it'll take you through to the uh, Dracker cable website, and if you scroll down, there's a data sheet, and you you're gonna Fantastic. need you're gonna need that data sheet to do the question. Okay. Four core. You've been a bit tight there, aren't you? I thought it was three phase. Yeah, it is. It oh. is. But if you look okay. underneath the steel wire, steel wire armor, the game brave up, now. It's used <laughs> as the CPC. So I like it. yeah, good. And and. Do you know, I haven't done this just for the question. I've done this because that's what we used to do. Then there's a reason for it as well, which you'll you'll sort of, you, it'll all come together and you'll go, ah, got it. Trust <laughs> me, trust me. So, yeah, there's a reason why we used to use 4Core. Um, so, yeah, there's a date sheet there. Don't Please don't use another date sheet from another manufacturer because some, the numbers might be slightly different. So, Please use the data sheet that's embedded. Okay. I'll note that on the website alongside the PDF as well. Yeah, because all it, I mean, the the values might not differ greatly, but when I'm going through the answers in yeah. you know next Relative time round, time. it might be the values a, a, a little bit out. So just, I'm going to use that one. Um, so you use that one, otherwise the readings will be different. Okay, so something a little bit different. So you might have to look into what you've got to do differently because the steel wire armor is going to be used as the, as the earth. So when you come to do something like R one R two, you've got to think, well, how can I determine that? I haven't, I can't. You know, if you look in the on site guide, um, in the appendix for the resistance of your cables, when you calculate an R one R two, you you might not be able to use it because there's nothing for armoured you'd be able to use the, the part for the size of the line conductor that you've determined but you might not be able to use that table for armoured so and it's a different material and it's steel as opposed to and it, copper and aluminium correct. and it, it is is that a dead cert that we can use that that armoring for the s for the for the cpc or not it might not be guaranteed but it might not be able to do it we'll have to see won't we mm, interesting but yeah use use that date sheet because you you won't be able to do it if uh, if you don't, all right. What a great time for my mouse battery to run out. I'll have to use the old scroll. <laughs> That's bad, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> so spare ways available. We're using a four core. It's thermosetting ninety degree. Please remember what we said last time. Um, is is the equipment rate to ninety degrees? Um, you know we might have to use uh, a different table if we can't determine that. <clears throat> Right, your routing of your cables. I've tried to keep this fairly straightforward because in the previous example that Richard gave, we had some real good uh, correction factors, rating factors. So I've tried to sort of keep this a bit more straightforward with the emphasis on other things on this particular question. So the cables are to be run through the array. So we're going on the underside of the array on a catenary wire. So for people who don't know what catenary wire is. It's a tension steel uh, wire rope, basically. So if you look on the images, you can see black DC cables underneath the panels. And we, it's 
<coughs> excuse me, we used to run the catenary wire from one end of the array to the other, pull it tight, tension it up, and then we used to cable tie all the DC cables and the and the panel cables to it. So your AC cables are going to be run in a similar way um, in order to save time and labour costs. Otherwise, we've got to start digging trenches and um, disturbing the wildlife and things like that. So um, we're going to put catenary wire from one end to the other and your cables are going to run that, on that catenary wire. So we've removed a lot of the rating factors that we'd normally have if it was buried in the ground, okay? Um, some people are shooting me for this. I've put the ambient temperature is 20 degrees just because I wanted to. I <laughs> wanted to keep it simple. I didn't want to, you know, we, we've got all different types of, I think we've had about a 10 degree difference in the temperature today, but I'm not too, I'm not too bothered about that. I've just put 20 degrees just to keep things a bit more straightforward for people who are doing the calc because I want you to focus on other things. So obviously your CA is is one. So you ain't gonna worry about that. Nice. Okie dokie. <clears throat> obviously I just put images on there just to try and bring it bring it to life a little bit. Oh, these are brilliant. Yeah, it's brilliant. Because it, it, you know, if you're not familiar with uh with the way that those have been installed, then you wouldn't know, would you? So no, it, no, it, 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 to make that. it is the easiest way to yeah, to install things, and it's a really reliable uh, system as well. That's good. Okay, so the loads themselves, um, you've got two new inverters. One's rated at twenty kilowatts three phase, and the other is rated at twenty seven point six. Again, there's an embedded data sheet within the PDF, so you can just click on it. And it will take you for using this this digital version, the PDF version. It takes straight to the date sheet. That will give you your sort of uh, current demand, okay, for the inverters. Uh, next thing we're going to consider is the length of run. So inverter three. Because don't forget we've got four inverters in total. The first uh, two that are already installed. And we just got a like for like because so we've just doubled the capacity of the system. Yeah. Inverter three <laughs> is 83 meters from 83 that, meters from that existing that big old array. You're buying that cable. Yeah. Well, what yeah. you've got to consider is each panel's Once. each panel's approximately about a meter wide. Yeah. And on a 50 kilowatt system, you've got 200 a panels, lot of panels roughly. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, that makes sense. And obviously, you've you've got You've got 100 at the top, 100 at the bottom. So effectively, it should be about 103 metres. But okay, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, makes sense. Team up. Yeah. So we've got two lengths of run there. Okay. <clears throat> so your actual question. So there's a lot. There's inf a lot of information to take in there. But I say use use a highlighter pen, or you could sort of get a separate sheet and put the, notes, the key yeah. information yeah. length for run. Yeah. You know, rating factors to consider. Uh, reference method, all that supply reference methods. Yeah. So what what I actually want everyone to do is actually I only want you to to do a cable calculation on inverter three, which is a twenty seven point six. But the reason why I've got both in there is just to sort of flesh out the the, the question as such. However, um, if those who want a, a bit more of sort of stretch and challenge, as we call it in education. Do both inverters. Mark, Mark said he'll give away a nice prize for that if anyone gets to get some both. If right. somebody yeah. submits a full on answer to both, we'll definitely get a safe isolation kit or something into their thing. hands. Yeah. There we good. go. See, for for, for me, um <clears throat> if I I mean if I was the stuff like this wasn't available when I was doing my design qual. Right. This would have been fab and I'd have done that second question as well because I'm a bit Someone will do it. Someone it's, will hundred percent do it. It's yeah. the same process, isn't it? It's the same stage. Yeah, it's, stage it's the same process. process. It's just the loading will be different yeah. and the the length slightly different. So <laughs> it's not going to be a major difference, but it'll get you in that get you yeah. in that sort of cycle. So what I've tried to do to keep things familiar is use the same sort of layout as as Richard does. So you've pretty much just got to do a standard cable calculation with thermal and shock constraints. Um, but I've used the same layout that Richard does, so it breaks it down a little bit 
easier. Obviously, we're always going to start with design current. We're always going to pick a relative few size. One thing that I'll need everyone to consider is when the inverters are running, they when it's a, a you know a decent level of irradiance as we call it. So if we've got, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be super hot or anything like. That, but if we've got a nice clear day uh, with little cloud those inverters will output exactly what it says on the tin. So you might want to consider, can that device um, sort of maintain that level of output for, for hours? So, for instance, if we've got something like a 20 amp MCB, is that device rated for continual 20 amps for you know, a duration of time. So just per perhaps consider that with you. Put your design head on and that's your design considerations. Yeah. And, and if you wanted to find that information out, Dave, where would we where would we find that information out? You know, let's say that we had got a 20 amp, let's go Hager, for instance. Yeah. And, uh, and we were thinking of, as you say, running that at 20 amps for, you know, seven, eight hours. Yeah. Is it the manufacturer we'd have to go to for that to find that information? Yeah, hundred yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, we've got we've got to go to the manufacturer's data. So whoever whoever it is, we yeah. you, if this was a real job, you'd go straight to you, you obviously you're always gonna have a preference on who you use, but you would um you know, you could contact them themselves and just say, Is this device right. rated for yeah. what it says on the tin for continual continual use? Yeah. Um because sometimes that it can be an issue with with PV systems. Yeah. If we and look at our standard yeah. circuits, there's obviously there's there's variables. Yeah. And obviously with a PV system, it will sort of drop and, and you know it will fluctuate. Yeah. But in certain instances, it will be pumping that amount of power and current through for for a you know a relatively long. Period it isn't. It is an important point, and it's even more prevalent with the hybrid inverters because you can have that flow of energy continuously because the batteries start outputting and whilst it's running in reverse in essence it's still putting that load that current through the protective device isn't it so you've got to yeah. check these things out it's a good point yeah mm. i say you you can't sort of go you can't necessarily go through this cable calculation like a, a a normal one for you know domestic lighting or something like that you've you've got to you've got to sort of make what you call assumptions as a designer so you know, some people might end up picking one sort of thing in a, in a few weeks, and and I'll sort of explain what we used to do in this instance uh, and why. Okay. And it goes back to engineering judgment, doesn't it? That we yeah. spoke about in the last few weeks. And because I'm an in inverter virgin, so to speak, do inverters have any any form of inrush current or anything? Is that a consideration or not? It's not necessarily a. a a consideration as such, but depending on the conditions when they're switched on, it can be, you know, so that's it, like in court. Yeah. yeah. Tend yeah. to be more of a more of a problem with the earth bolt leakage that might occur when they're first turned on. And in my experience of some older inverters, most definitely they seem to leak a little bit more to earth as the first warming up and once they get going, they're a little bit more settled. Okay. Again, another you know, another consideration, isn't it? Yeah. It's an interesting question. I like the look of this. I think it's going to be another good example yeah. to yeah, stretch so people in a different direction. I think it's fantastic. Um, this, I'm going to have a go at it. This was the second one. I did another one, and I think it was a bit too too complex. <laughs> so I thought but again, that's maybe, a, maybe it, another time. Yeah, absolutely. Once, you, once people have got yeah. the thing for this, you know, it's something you can yeah. try in a few weeks or something, you know. Yeah. I think um, it's really good. Really yeah. Good. Cheers. Um, next thing then is just determine the reference method. I've said that it's on a catenary wire, so obviously see whether you can find that in, in the in the regulations or something, Appendix four, something yeah. similar. Um, appropriate rating factors. There might not be hardly any. Yeah, I've tried to keep it simple with the rating factors on this one. Yeah. Then you're going to determine your minimum current carrying capacity that the cable is capable of carrying. And when you're doing this as well, obviously the same as what Rich does, we're going to encourage you to quote the table yeah. and the column number 
this is key when you're doing cable calculations, especially if you're going to doing it as a separate qual in the future. Um, like we said previously, if you the more information you put, the more likely you are to pick up the the higher marks. So if you put as much detail as you can, that might be the difference between a distinction and a credit or a credit and a pass. Definitely. Like so Craig will verify that. Yeah. You know, having recently got himself a distinction in his nine six, so, you know, yeah. it's and that, that's that's not an easy task at, no. at all. So no, no. that's yeah. off to, to Craig there. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is as well, it, it's for you. It's for right. you because if you write down the table or the page number and the column number, if when we go through the answers, you can see oh, I've used the wrong column. What a sausage. I've used the single phase column instead mm -hmm. of the three phase column, something like that. Easily done. So, yeah, keep um, getting a habit of, of writing. You know, if I do a cable calc, I want it on like two pages and I can I can track everything. Yeah. Um. Then you've got your standard stuff, your value of current <clears throat> from the table, your IT then you're going to find your minimum cross-sectional area. Then you've got your vault drop. Be careful here, yeah, with your vault drop, as we've previously said. Okay. And then, similar to the EV one, I want you to tell me what the maximum is, because this is a, this is an area that people can sometimes get wrong, especially with three-phase. So I want you to sort of work it back and tell me what, what's the maximum at that at that particular area. Um, Inverter, inverter three, which is the, the bigger one of the two. Then we're going to do R1, R2, which would be particularly difficult if you don't use the Draker cables information because it's not in in the on site guide as it would normally. Then we're going to do uh, fault loop impedance. Please don't be worried if it's a large number because we're starting with 33 at the origin, aren't we? Yeah, with, right. with your rod yeah. resistance. So, yeah. um, and then we've got IPF, and I've put in brackets, be careful there. And there's a reason for that because IPF is perspective fault current. <clears throat> and what people tend to focus on is perspective earth fault current or PEFC. Nine times out of 10, that's fine because you're working on a PME system. So, your PEFC, perspective earth fault current, and your perspective short circuit current, which is PSCC, will relatively be exactly the same. Because at the origin, the earth and the neutral are combined, aren't they? So if you do uh, if you do the ZE test in a PFC and a PSCC, at the origin of a, a TNCS system, otherwise known as PME, your two fault current values will almost be identical. So However, let's just remind ourselves on this one, it's a TT installation. We, we've already seen the ohmic value for the rod resistance is very high. So going back to what I was talking about last time, it's that seesaw effect. So if the resistance is high, what's happening with the fault current is going to be very low. So if you, if you calculate your fault current just on your earth fault current, you're going to end up with a very, very small amount of fault current. So you might need to consider your perspective short circuit current as well, which might bounce you back to question five. So just something to consider. And I'd rather tell you now than you you sort of leave, leave you in the lurch. It's good because we haven't had to consider that before, have we, generally, you know? Because yeah, this, this, this is what I mean. We, we had a chat, didn't we, Rich? And we yeah. tried to look at... Okay, that, that I'm going to come up with something that's a little bit different. Yeah, it's so. good. Yeah, it's good. Then obviously it's a really got a, good you, example. Yeah, your, your required CPC size, and you've got to determine does that SWA of that four core armored comply? Is that steel uh, wire armor the equivalent of a copper conductor? Because obviously the resistivity of the material is different. We know that steel is not as good as conductor as copper. It's still half decent, but we've just got to try and determine, you know, so we might not use the adiabatic there. We might use something else. So that's another hint. I'm trying to trying to guide you here. Don't want to give you the give you the answer, but I'm trying to guide you. So you might not use you could probably still try doing it, 
But if you use the adiabatic equation with the perspective air fault current, your device will never operate ah, nice because you. the resistance is too high and your fault current's too low. Yeah, hence why we use other other devices on TT systems. But if you get stuck, then don't worry. Just have a go at it. If you're stuck yes. at certain part, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Don't just worry give, too much. All this is is giving it a go. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I don't know the, the I don't know the this the skills of the audience. Some people might find it straightforward. Some people might find it really difficult. Just get as far as you can. That's it. And when we're back on, we'll go through it, and hopefully, I'll be able to explain, and we'll have that have that moment where we think, ah, yeah, I can see now. That's what it's all about. Yeah. yeah. It's not about me making an overly complicated question and saying, oh, you, you're no good because you, you can't do it. That's not what it's about. I'm, I've done this to try and challenge some people and try and bring everyone's skills up to a certain level. So um, then the last few questions is, I just need you to explain if the new circuit complies with the requirements of BS7671, so you might need to look in a different part of the regs that you haven't used before. Um, but I want you to just sort of, rather than just say, yes, it complies, yeah, like we normally do, we do an adiabatic equation, minimum size is this, we've calculated this, <laughs> therefore, you know, therefore it complies. I want you to just give me a bit of an explanation if, if that circuit complies with BS7671. And that's the type of language that's used, isn't it? In yeah. the questions in, Explain, in the design describe, qualifications. State, yeah. Determine. That's right. So Those, that's the language. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. if, and if you're doing, if you're ever doing a written exam, always look at the amount of marks as well. That's probably something that I could have added to there. Um, if it's got a high level of marks, you need to put a lot of information. If it says state, and there's two marks. State two things that you need to consider. You're looking for two things. You just put, bomb, bomb, job done. It says explain, and there's eight marks available. You need to you need to go into it a bit more. Think that's you, kind of trying to explain to your customer or your client. Yeah, yeah. And what that's delving into is your knowledge, isn't it? What's your knowledge? Yeah. Is it yeah. just something I I I know because someone said. It has to be that, or what's yeah. your understanding of it in your own words? It doesn't have to be. That's it. You know, yeah, it doesn't. Page. It doesn't have to, doesn't it, have to match what I put. Yeah, this is this because yeah. of this, which you know complies with this because you must have this. Yeah, yeah. etc. You know exactly. It's good. That it's good. Then last, it, 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 this is the last page. Don't worry. I'm um, uh, <laughs> not going to go on too long. What I want you to think is state, so you can list this one. What additional considerations need to be made with regards to the installation being on a farm? So we're not domestic, we're not commercial, it's not industrial. So we've got to consider, you know, parts one to six of the regs on any installation. But what are the additional considerations because it's on a farm? Yeah. So yeah. you're going to be utilising a different part of the, of the regulations. And I just want you to... Give a couple of things that we've that we've got to consider because it's on a farm, yeah. So any any couple of things out of that particular, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Two would be two would be great. Three would be even better. But you can, I'd say you can two, over ten. Two. Mark will buy you a four pack of Carlin. <laughs> 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 yeah. So just Good, just yeah. to get you thinking, not every yeah. not everything is not right. all the work you're ever going to do in your life will ever be in a house, a shop, an office, or a factory. Think outside the box a little bit more. Okay. Uh, question nine: State any other design considerations to be made for the solar PV system on the AC side only. So, there's something as a designer that Mark's almost sort of touched on that you've got to consider when you're working on PV systems, and it's to do with the equipment. And I'm going to say no more. <laughs> No, no, okay. it's good. It's a good one. Right. So what considerations have we got? General. Because it's on a farm. Mm -hmm. So imagine imagine you're just doing an install on a farm. What's the issue? What are the considerations we've got to make? The second one, work on a PV system. What have we got to consider as a designer? What issues could we have? And what have we got to account for? Similar to the devices. Are they... Are they rated for that rate for continual yeah. use? Okay. Last and two because, things. 
Go on, because, yeah, because it's a farm, there's additional requirements because of think of the things that are going to be in the farm and what it's going yeah. to be exposed to external influences, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. This is why there exactly. are extra considerations because of what it is, if that kind of makes sense. No, no, that's a yeah, that's a valid point. Um number 10, if the installation method, the installation method was changed. Um, to the new circuits being buried direct in the ground instead of a catenary wire, what would the requirements be? Ooh. So is there anything <laughs> specific yeah, with regards to the type of installation that we're on that we'd have to consider? So we're going catenary wire because it's easier. It, it we, We've got access. We can see the cables, so it's easier for inspection and testing. Uh, the client's uh, environmentally aware, so she doesn't want disturbance to the to the ground and the wildlife, etc. So, if it was going to be buried direct in the ground, what other things would we have to do? Um, even if what one thing there would be great, yeah, one thing there would be great. And then for the people who've uh, found it okay, and they want a bonus question. I want you to investigate and determine if separate DC isolators are required on each of the DC strings. So typically we'd have six strings on inverter three and four strings on inverter four. So it's basically four, four circuits, four DC circuits, so a positive and a, and a negative, basically. So I want you to find out, but it's not... Um, you don't have to do that one. It's just a bonus one. So investigate and determine, do we need to have separate DC isolators? So all your other questions are based on the AC side, and this is just for people who want to perhaps know a little bit more and want to d delve into the DC side. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I love it. That is such a nice question to close on with that because there's a rabbit hole and a half to jump down on that one. <laughs> yeah. So... um. Yeah, see how you get on with that. I'd probably, I'd probably leave it a, a week or two, definitely, before we yeah. go over it because it is it can be quite technical. Yeah. I think so. Having uh, looked at that, I think it makes sense to probably give it a couple of weeks. Yeah, give it. So a I'll, I'll, I'll put this onto the Apprentice One to One website with the file alongside it and a video podcast episode of this recording with that, and I'll link it across all the social media of Apprentice One to One and share it out. Uh, hopefully you guys give it a little share as well and we'll see if people yeah, yeah. want to take on the challenge and have a go at it. And in a couple of weeks' time, we'll get together. Um, I'm going to have a go at answering it. You guys will already know the answers, no doubt. And you I can don't. I through. haven't seen it. This is a first. He was going to show me yesterday in the office, but we didn't get time. Yeah. Busy day. You've got to, you, I'll have a go. Made me do yours. You made me do your questions, so you've got to do this. I'm going to do it, mate. I'm going to do it. I've already <laughs> done it in my head. I've already done it in my head. I've got, I've got, um, oh, I've got a big drum of um, two fives. In, in the shed, I'll probably just throw that in. Yeah, don't, um, don't forget as well. There's a clue in this image, ah, of course. Yeah, okay, okay, nice clue at the top. Something that we have to, yeah. um, have to consider the number. If you can zoom in, you'll probably see the numbers changed, but you know, the, Craig, Craig will enjoy this as well. Craig will like this. These are images, uh, these are actual images of the jobs that I worked on. Um, which I've got hundreds of, so I thought, why not? Why not use yeah, it? It's good to good use. <laughs> Repurpose them. I like yeah, it. Yeah. Now it's a really, really good example, Dave. That is fantastic. I think the people at varying levels will get something from that. And as you've rightly said, all the way through, take it as far as you can. If you yeah. can't get to the end, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Just joining in is all part yeah, of the fun. I'll yeah. probably get halfway and lose track and have to be told how wrong I got it by you guys in a couple of weeks' time. I'm not going <laughs> to cheat. That doesn't use, matter. I won't matter. cheat and use yeah. OM this time. Last time. I run out of time, so I just quickly did it in electrical OM. This time I'm going to do it the old school way with the books and pen and paper. Yeah. And yeah, join in with us. Join in with us. A couple of weeks' time, we'll all be back. Is there anything you guys want to add to this one before we end it tonight? Um, no, just, just like I say, just give it a go. See how you get on. It is a challenging one. Don't beat yourself up if, you, if you're struggling with it. It's meant to be challenging. It's not meant to be easy. And uh, yeah, just, just get as far as you can. And just and follow the same process, useful. yeah, that we followed in previous cable calcs, albeit, you know, don't forget 
that you can always use part two in 7671 if you're unsure of symbols again definitions of we've used yeah. appendix four in the past you might have to delve into one of the other parts because you know this is within itself special i ain't going to say any more on that uh and just you know reference each bit as you go along like dave has suggested it's good practice to do that and just yeah. say get on but enjoy it and have a go you know i'm yeah. certainly gonna have a little play with that tomorrow and and see how we get on with it so um but yeah it's good. right Nice one, Dave. I've really enjoyed hearing about your backstory, David. Thanks for coming to share that with us on the Apprentice One to One podcast as the start of this episode and for the time you've put into preparing that awesome question for us as well. Please, everybody, do go off and get involved. There'll be a link alongside the description of this podcast where you can go and find all of that information to join in with the links in the PDF itself to go off and look at the other information on the data sheets. Don't forget to do that. Come back in a couple of weeks' time and run through the answers with us. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you on the next one. Cheers, everyone. Been a pleasure.